Well, we're going to talk about the power of the tongue. Jesus tells us in Matthew that we're supposed to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, men have created whole denominations. They've created whole doctrines filled with rules and regulations. And they have those rules and regulations trying to fulfill this commandment in Matthew to be perfect by their rules and regulations. But you know what? I've never seen rules and regulations make it work. So what can we do to make ourselves perfect or to make ourselves mature? Well, obviously it's possible or Jesus wouldn't have told us to do it. So evidently it's possible. So if the Bible suddenly gave you one thing that you could do to come, become spiritually mature, to become perfect, would you do it? We need to ask ourselves. Okay, later you can look up James 3 verse 2. But it says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, you need to mark that in your Bible. If anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he, he'll be a perfect man. You know, God made that pretty easy. Now, that sounds like surely, you know, if he tells us we can be perfect by not stumbling in, in what we say, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, according to this scripture, what is it then <clears throat> that makes you a perfect man or woman? According to this scripture, controlling the tongue is going to make us perfect. You know, and you would think we'd all grab that and say, oh, you know, if that's all it takes, that's where I'm going for, you know. <clears throat> but there is so much power in what we say. Now, some of you are saying, well, I've read about the power of the tongue. I've already heard those lessons. I already know all about it. Well, it's true that most of us have heard teachings on the power of the tongue. So why is it that it has to be retaught? Why isn't it working? You know, I mean, when you think about it, that is one of the hardest things that we have to put up with. So here's the secret. I was talking to this man on a plane several years ago, and we were talking about the power of the tongue. Uh, it might have been a time when I, when I first taught this. <clears throat> and he made a statement that's well worth repeating. He said, this is not a new revelation to me. He said, I've heard it. But he said, I lost the conviction of it. And I thought about that for a long time. And that's true. We're not going to walk in this thing that will cause us to be perfect. Uh, we're not going to walk in it if we lose the conviction, if we don't have a conviction. When we lose the conviction of anything, <clears throat> you know, uh, then we may as well have not, never even heard it. And I felt like that's what the Lord told me one time. You know, if you lose the conviction of this, you know, it, it didn't do you any good. Why did you even hear it? Now, many of us have lost the conviction of the revelation now of this truth because it's it, you have to keep reminding yourself, you know. Uh, why would we lose the conviction of something this powerful? And that's what I've asked myself. So I'm going to tell you why. Because most of the time we hear this and it's just a formula. You know, uh, we tend to get legalistic and we hear it sort of as a rule. And maybe we try to keep the rules for a while. And finally, when it's really not a real conviction of the heart, you know, we come back to some of our old habit patterns. And we, we fall down again. Now, this is not a formula because it's not a new formula that we're needing. We don't need that. <clears throat> it's something else that we have to do. And uh, I, as, as I was praying, I felt like the Lord said that I have to confess my covenant and come to a place where this literally comes alive on the inside of me, where it becomes a conviction. And um, it can't be a formula. Okay, our first confessions have to be byproducts then of, of a conviction, the conviction of the supernatural power that words carry. I'm going to say that one more time because it's so important. We need to get a conviction down on the inside of us. We can hear it all day that our, our confessions are important, what we say is important, but until we get a conviction of the supernatural power that our words carry, we're, we're not going to do that much about it. We're not going to think of it. So that needs to become as real to us on the inside as the conviction that Jesus is coming again. I think all of us would say, yes, I believe Jesus is coming again. We believe that. Listen, the revelation of the power of our words has to become just that real on the inside of us. 
just as real as it is on the inside of us that we know Jesus is coming again. So confessing the word cannot be just another rule, you know, it can't be that. We're going to have to come to the place where we hear this way down deep on the inside of us for us to be able to have it come alive on the inside of us, for us to walk in it. You know, when Bill was little, <clears throat> he couldn't say yellow. He couldn't pronounce the Ys. And so, you know, <clears throat> he would always say wellow. That was how he said, said it. And we worked with him and we'd say, Bill, say yellow, yellow. And then he could hear us and he'd say yellow. And then we'd say, oh, that's really good. Now put it together. It's not just yellow, but put it together. And he'd say, okay. And he'd say, well <laughs> And we got so uh, frustrated because Jack and I both said, when he gets to be grown, is he still going to be sad? Because he said it for so many years. But something had to happen on the inside. He had to hear it on the inside. And there came a day when he finally heard it. He heard that why sound. And when he did, he started saying it correctly. <clears throat> and so the Lord was just speaking to me. And he said, that's what we have to do. We've got to get a conviction of this down on the inside. So, and when we get that conviction, it'll be just like Bill started saying yellow. Uh, when we get a conviction, we'll start saying, hey, the words of my mouth are so important. They're so important. But how on earth now do we do this? Okay, now stay with me through this Bible study. Don't let your mind wander. And pretend that you're hearing this for the first time. Pretend this is the first time you've heard about the spoken word and just open up your spirit to hear this because it will make all the difference in the world to us. The words of our mouth will literally change the direction of our life every single time. And uh, <clears throat> when we do that, then the conviction will come. Now, I'm going to read a long scripture to you in James 3, 3 through 6. <clears throat> but he was say James was really saying a lot about uh, uh, what we say. Okay, it says, now we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, and it directs their entire body. Behold, the ships also. So he's talked about the bits in the horse's mouth, and then he says, behold, the ships also. They're so great, you know, and they're also driven by a strong wind, and yet they're directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Okay, so he's, he's making these comparisons of the words of our mouth, first of all to, uh, to a ship and then to a horse. Also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set afire by such a small fire. Talking about the words of our mouth. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as what defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. It's set on fire by the fire of hell. Okay, when you think about that, I mean, James was saying a mouthful. This is comparing our tongue, what we say, uh, to the bits in the horse's mouth that controls the horse. It's talking about the rudder on a ship that controls uh, the entire ship. And it's talking about fire. And, and what a fire can do. And then verse 8, But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Okay, when, when we read that in verse 8, that should make us want to do something about the words of our mouth. Okay, why did James make it sound so hard to tame the tongue? Because very few people ever push on through to get the conviction of this revelation. Very few people do. Uh, they see the power of the spoken word, and they uh, come up with a formula. You know, they, they think, okay, I'll confess this for a month, and then I'll have it down, and I'll become perfect, like this uh, scripture is telling me. But they eventually fall back into calling it wellow. <laughs> That's where they fall back. They go right back to the same old habits, letting their mouth just run wild. And when you think about it, you probably can't think of very many people that you know. Maybe you can't think of anyone you know. You can't think of even people in your family who have controlled the tongue in, in every way. Now, why is the tongue so unruly? Now, we know certainly God didn't create it to be unruly because it certainly uh, was not a problem before the fall. So it's obviously a major target of the enemy for it to have become so dangerous. And there's probably nothing as dangerous to us as our tongue, what, what we say with our mouth. Okay, just look around in the Christian world. It's the tongue that most Christians 
are having a problem with. They may have developed themselves, their Christian walk in so many ways, and yet you'll find out that most every Christian has a problem in some area with the tongue. Either they're making bad confessions, or some people are cursing, other people are using their tongue to gossip. Uh, sometimes it may be a sharp, critical tongue where they just, you know, they lash out at people. Or maybe it's a negative attitude, and that negative attitude comes out in what they say. So we know it's a major target because no one is exempt from some kind of attack of the enemy against their words. Now, I want you to think about this. In times of war, in order to win, we always go after the most strategic point. We don't use our, our time and our expense to bomb out an empty rice field. Nobody does that. What we do, we go after a major bridge, or sometimes we go after a power plant, or, or, or maybe an ammunition factory. And that's exactly what Satan's doing. That's exactly what he's doing. Now, if Satan has launched this much attack against the tongue, and just like it says in verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. And if no one is making much headway in this area, when God says in uh, James 3, verse 2, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, you would think that would be the goal for every Christian. Okay, I want to get to this point because Jesus said, if I don't stumble in what I say, I'm a perfect man then the tongue must be a powerhouse in God's eyes. He must see it entirely differently than what most Christians see it. And it is a powerhouse, and Satan knows it, and that's why he's thrown his heaviest artillery against the words of our mouth, against our tongue. Okay, verse 6 again. The tongue is a fire of the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among us, our members as that which defiles the entire body. You know, we could think of a lot of things that, a person could do that could defile the entire body, but it's the tongue, it's the words that, that the Lord is directing us to. The entire direction of our life is set on fire by this. The direction we go in life is determined by our tongue, the words of our mouth. Okay, now the tongue is what actually sets the course of our life when you think about it. You know, heaven or hell is decided by what we say, our success or failure many times is, is determined by what comes out our mouth, sickness or health. You know, you'll hear people talking about, uh, oh, they're just sick all the time. Or, they'll, or someone else will be saying, you know what, God has really blessed me. I walk in divine health. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Actually, our tongue maps out our entire destiny. And sometimes we forget that. Now, that's pretty major. That's pretty important. So no wonder Satan is after it. No wonder that's his main goal. Okay, I want to take just a moment now, and I want to explain why the tongue has that kind of power. Everything in this earth is governed by the law of sowing and reaping. We know that. We've been taught that. Everything in the physical realm, everything in the spiritual realm. We talk about seed time and harvest forever. And there's no way to get around that law because it governs everything in the physical and in the spiritual the entire earth revolves around the law of sowing and reaping. And faith is a seed. And what do we do with seeds? We're to plant a seed. Okay, faith is a seed that has to be planted. And we forget sometimes that the way we plant that seed of faith is by saying what the Word says. That's how you plant that seed of faith. Now, spiritual seeds are pouring out of our mouth all day long, every day. Good seeds and bad seeds. You know, I find myself in a daytime <clears throat> and I'll look back and I'll think, you know what? I had some bad seeds coming out of my mouth, you know, and I think we can all say that. Now, it's kind of like the <gasps> farmer. He's walking up and down the rows in his field and he's broadcasting the seed in every direction. And that's exactly what we do. We're exactly like that farmer. We're broadcasting seeds every single day by the words that are coming out of our mouth. Now, there's one principle in the Word of God by which faith works every single time. And it's in Romans 10, 9, and 10. Now, when it's written here in the Word, it's written in the positive sense, but it also works in the negative. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Okay, that's your faith principle. Believing 
believing it, and then confessing it with your mouth. Okay, by the same token, if you're confessing wrong things, you know, you're going to find out that that's exactly the harvest you're going to get. Just exactly like we get the harvest of righteousness and going to heaven when we do this particular uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, right? If we do it the wrong way, we're going to have exactly the opposite harvest. It's good because what you sow, what, every single time is going to be what you reap. Okay, now in addition to eternal life, the word salvation, as you all know, means five different things. Health, healing, deliverance, protection, and provision. So everything for which you will ever use your faith is going to fall one of, under one of those five categories. So salvation is the all-inclusive word that includes everything. Okay, now the principle for obtaining anything from God then is, number one, we have to believe the word, but then that's not enough. Number two, we have to confess because it's not going to work if we just believe it. We have to confess it. We have to confess it not only... <clears throat> Uh, think it, but we've got to confess it with our mouth. But it only works now if you truly believe what you're saying. If you're convicted <clears throat> that what you're saying is truth, in other words, if you have this conviction down in your heart, that's why just exactly like that man on the plane was telling me, he said, I lost the conviction of it. He said, I quit, quit realizing how important it was. And every time we realize that we've kind of gotten away from that conviction, we need to bring ourselves back and say no. God has put so much emphasis on the words of our mouth. I've got to come back. I've got to make it one of the most important things in my life. And that's exactly why some people <clears throat> seem to get by with making some bad confessions without, you know, really suffering the consequences. And they'll even tell you, well, you know, I've made bad confessions. It just, that doesn't work. They, they say anything they please, and they said, you know, I get by with it. Well, sometimes it's a delayed harvest. Sometimes they don't realize that the repercussions are going to come later on down the road. But sometimes for a lot of people, they're saying things and they don't really mean it. Sometimes they're just saying something to shock. Have you ever said something because you knew it was going to shock somebody when you said it? Uh, sometimes people will say wrong things just to get attention. I've seen kids who have said just exactly the opposite of what they want, their parents wanted them to say. And they were doing it to get attention. But it's not something that uh, we, we don't realize. The danger of doing that is that it might not be showing up because you're not really believing it. You're saying it, but you're not believing it. But the, the danger is when you say something long enough, then finally it comes into being. And a lot of people say, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that if I was saying that, that I was in danger because I didn't see anything go wrong. But they don't realize if they keep saying it, the time's going to come. It's, it's going to bring the harvest back on them. I had a lady once, and she would so often, and she didn't mean it. Uh, she wasn't really serious, but her husband would do something she didn't like, and she'd say, you know, I think we just need to get a divorce. We're just not right for each other. And uh, she didn't mean that. She wasn't about to get a divorce. But the time came, she kept the words of her mouth, the words of her mouth. It finally uh, became a reality, and they did get a divorce. Now, if you say those negative things long enough, you'll finally build faith to believe it, and then it happens. Okay, that's true in the negative, but thank goodness the opposite is also true. That's the good news. If you say what the Word of God says long enough, <clears throat> and you say it until you build faith to believe it, in spite of anything that you see or anything that you hear or anything you feel, then the Word will begin at some point to manifest in your life. It has to. It's a spiritual law. And it works just like Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. It's a faith principle. And if you do it, when you finally really believe it and you start saying it, it'll come to pass every single time. Now, let me say right here that believing is not a feeling. You know, so many times uh, people are trying to work up a feeling to believe it or they're working up a feeling to have faith. Our faith is not a feeling. It's just a decision. You don't have to feel anything. It's just a choice. You make a choice. I'm going to believe this because it's the Word of God. And when you make a decision to believe some portion of the Word, then you confess it until it becomes a conviction. Once you believe it, you start confessing it until it becomes a conviction in the heart. And at every single time will bring the results. It, it, it will not fail once you, <clears throat> once you put that into practice. 
Now, it takes both sides of the coin. You have to believe it, come to a place where you believe it, and you confess it. And uh, <clears throat> one without the other is not going to work. So this is going to sound a little bit drastic, but the word will not do you any good until you speak it. And a lot of people don't realize. They think, well, if I believe the word, that's all it takes. No, it's not going to do one bit of good until we start saying it, until we speak it. Now, I'm going to go as far as saying that you can believe it and still won't do, any, do you any good if you don't speak it, and, because the demons even believe it. Okay, let me give you an example. Proverbs 4, 20 and 22 says that the word is health to us. And I remember I confessed that for a long time. Lord, I thank you according to Proverbs 4, 20, the word is health to me. But the Lord then began to show me in Proverbs 12, verse 21, it says, but the tongue of the wise is what brings the health. So it takes both. The word is true and, and it's what's offering health to us. But the tongue is what brings that health on into being. Okay, now what are the two scriptures, what are these two scriptures saying? They're saying that life and death is in the word. That's the power. That's the word. But it's not going to do us any good until the tongue then brings that health into being, when the tongue starts saying it. Now, a, <clears throat> a written page does nothing to change us. You know, I can, uh, I can see the Bible and it has all kinds of promises through it. But those promises, I can look at them. They're not going to be one bit of good until I finally look at it and I say, that's mine. I want it. And we take it and we, we, we believe it and we start saying it with our mouth. Now, I don't know why God made it that way because it's so simple. But he made it where we have to do both. Now, I'm not talking about believing and confessing things that go beyond the word of God. You know, you, you can get in witchcraft doing that. I'm talking about believing and calling into being every single thing that God's Word says and things that God has spoken to you in your heart. Now, I'm not trying to give you a, a materialistic uh, principle tonight where you start calling in new cars and, you know, speedboats. Uh, that's, that's not where I'm headed tonight. Not that it's wrong. God wants us to have cars. He wants us to have uh, good things. But don't let that be our focus. It can't be our focus. We are to seek first his kingdom. And he says, seek first my righteousness. And then he says, all of these things will be added. So it's not that we head after the things. We do exactly what he tells us to do. We seek first his kingdom, first his righteousness. We believe it, we confess it, and then the things begin to be added. But I'm talking about believing and calling into being everything that God's word says, everything that God has spoken to you in your heart something that you've prayed for and believed God for. You know, start confessing that because it's what comes out your mouth. It's not just what you believe. It's what you say with your mouth. Now, something else very important. It's very important for us to realize that the law of sowing and reaping was put into effect by God. And he intended to bring good only. That's what God intended. But we're going to find out that we choose to operate it in the negative. And if we choose to operate it in the negative, it's going to do the same thing. It'll, it'll bring the results, but it'll be in the negative. It'll produce negative results. Everything produces after its kind. You know, uh, when a person says, Lord, I have this problem and it's getting worse, and they, they, they're believing it, they're saying it's getting worse and they keep saying it, uh, they're going to find out that's exactly what they're going to get. We can't confess what we have. We can't confess what, what's coming on us or what we fear. Because when we do, I can promise you it's going to get worse. You may be thinking, well, it's the truth. I'm not going to lie about it. Okay, that's where we have to have our mind renewed. Because, yes, a lot of things we're looking at, it does look like the truth. you know. But that's where we've lost the conviction of this revelation. If God says something in his word, we might not have seen it yet. It may not have manifested but it's not a lie. God can't lie. If we realize this is what God is saying, then I can say exactly what he says. And even though it hasn't manifested yet, I'm not lying. I'm confessing exactly what the Lord in heaven has promised us. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 very plainly says that the circumstances that you see are temporal. 
That's a scripture you need to mark in your Bible. That means the, what you see is temporary. And so that means it, it's subject to change. And you can change it with what you believe and what you say. But the things you don't see, the Word of God, those are the things that are eternal. Now, you can change the same things you see by believing God and confessing exactly what God says. But here's the hitch that catches a lot of people. Faith is nothing more than a choice to believe some promise in the Word. And the moment you choose to quit believing it or quit confessing it, then it's not faith and it turns into doubt. You know, a lot of people will they'll say, well, I've been confessing that for years and it never happened. Well, they, they've backed out of it. They're saying the wrong thing now, and it's not going to come to pass. But the ones that will hang in there and say, I believe this word. I haven't seen it manifest yet, but I believe it, and I'm not going to turn loose it. I promise you, it will come to pass. The faith principle is in operation. But if, if, we're, if we've given up on, on a promise... We could have said it right for 10 years, but the moment that we give up on it, then we're operating in the negative. And that's why so many people lose the conviction of this revelation, just exactly like that guy on the plane. You know, he had lost the conviction of how true this revelation is because they thought it was the word that didn't work. But it wasn't the word that quit working. Anytime the word of God, the promises are not working in your life, I can promise you it's never the word that didn't work. We've either quit confessing it, we've quit believing it. It only works in our behalf when we are confessing exactly what God's Word says and we're determined until I see it come to pass, I will not quit confessing. I will not quit believing it. It has to be a, a conviction in our heart where we're convinced in our heart. Now, if you're not convinced of something, then I promise you it'll slip away. And that's why a lot of times we've lost the, the, the revelation of, of this promise. Uh, we've let it slip away from us. Okay, now the good confessions that you make that are genuinely coming out of the conviction of your heart, those are the ones now that you've worked out ahead of time in your prayer time. Those are the ones that you've confessed and thanked God for it and and you, every time you get before him in prayer, you're thanking him again. Lord, I thank you for this promise that you've given to me. You keep doing that, and it keeps building it in your heart. And you're saying it, you're believing it in your heart, and it will come to pass. Now, the kind of confessions that, uh, like this, they can change a situation. And, uh, uh, but the ones that are going to change your situation are the ones that you've birthed in your prayer closet where you say, Lord, your word says thus and so, and I'm not going to lay down that promise. I don't care whether it looks like it hasn't come to pass. I'm not going to lay down that promise. And then it will not just be some good-sounding confession that we say to cover up our fears or, or maybe to cover up our doubts. Some people will say the promise in the word, but what they're doing, they're trying to cover up a fear. But if you keep saying it and keep believing God and keep saying it, the time will come that your, the confessions of your mouth based on the word will tear the fear down. It'll tear the unbelief down. Now, sometimes we're making right confessions, <clears throat> but all we're doing is hiding that fear. And we need to be honest enough with ourselves to say, okay, I'm making the right confessions, but I'm still just covering up fear so it's not truly belief yet. And we need to keep confessing it until it turns into faith, turns into belief. And you'll know the difference. I know the things that I haven't totally worked out in my heart yet. And if you'll be honest with yourself, you know the things that maybe you're saying the right things, but uh, it hasn't come to pass yet. And you have to be honest enough to say, no, I'm not really believing it yet. I haven't got that down in my heart. But that's where so many people, they get, and they finally just give up and they think, oh, well. And so they throw their confession away and they throw their believing away. And then the opposite is true. I, um, you know, but you're going to find out when you've birthed it in your prayer closet and you've confessed it until it has become a conviction, then you're going to be able to say, no, I'm not turning this loose. I've worked too hard for it. I'm not turning it loose. And because it has become a, a, the conviction we have to have. I believe it in my heart because I've birthed it in my prayer closet. And 
very seldom will you ever be able to get a truth of God's word really locked down inside of you until you birth it yourself, until you get in that prayer closet and you say it until you honestly give it to God and it clicks. It's like something explodes on the inside of you. So I know the things that I've birthed by saying it. And when, when they're there, it's I know that I know that I know that I know this is a truth. And when you, when you feel that, when, when you get that, I know that I know that I know that this is a truth, I mean, there's nothing like it. You want to jump and you want to clap and you want to do everything because uh, something, uh, because you, you've come into the realm of truly believing and truly confessing. Now, there's a difference between those confessions and the ones that I'm half-heartedly saying. Whatever promise you want, working in your life, it's worth whatever it takes to daily get into your prayer closet and cry out to God until it does become a conviction. Because you can say it all day and, and, and you can want to believe it, you know, but until you birth it, uh, th there's still that hindrance there that keeps it from coming to pass. Now, conviction uh, is, is the key word. If you don't hear anything else tonight, I want you to hear that this has to become a conviction on the inside of you. So look at all the areas in your life where you see the most defeat. We can all look at our life and say, okay, I'm doing pretty good over here, but Lord, I know this one's still not what it needs to be. Uh, and, and you may be able to say, Lord, I'm saying all the right things, but you can know, if you'll be honest with yourself, you can know deep down whether it's really a conviction or whether you're saying it because the Word said it and you want it to come to pass. And, it, and if you're just wanting it, but you haven't really birthed it in where it's a conviction in your heart, then you're going to find out. Uh, you'll stumble up the first time that something happens uh, that it looks like it didn't work. When that happens, you'll, you'll fumble around and you'll lose what you've, uh, what you've gained. You've got to come to the place where you say, Lord, I'm saying it because it's your word. I believe it with all my heart, and I am going to continue to say it until it comes to pass. Now, if it's not working then, then it's usually one of three things. It may be that it's not the right timing. Maybe it's coming. It's already in the process, but uh, God may be working on somebody else's heart. There may be things God's doing behind the scenes to make it to come to pass. But just keep doing what you're doing and don't give up. Or number two, you need to see if there's a point of reference that God's told you something to do that you haven't done yet. Or number three, it may be that it's not a conviction yet. And that's where you have to be honest with yourself and say, okay, I believe it because it's in the word, but it hasn't become a conviction in my heart yet. I haven't said it and believed it until it, it has exploded on the inside of me. And if that's the case, then just begin to walk the floor and cry out to God. I mean, literally walk the floor and cry out to God and uh, just say, Lord, you say it in your word, and I'm going to say what you've said, and I'm going to say what you've said, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it until it becomes rhema on the inside of me. Once that happens, then it's, it's a done deal. That's where God wants us. Now, many times I've taken my Bible and I've turned maybe to a uh, particular uh, promise. And I said, Lord, you've promised this to me and I'm not going to turn it loose. I don't care what it looks like. I'm not turning this promise loose because you said, Lord, that this is a truth. You said it's mine and I'm going to say it and believe it until it comes to pass. And if you'll do that, whatever promise it is that you're wanting, if you'll do that, uh, then there may be a point of obedience. And if it is, we'll say, Lord, show me what I need to do. But then when you continue to say, Lord, I'm not going to turn it loose until it becomes that conviction. And when it becomes that conviction, then I know it's coming. I know it's there. Now, God is looking for men and women who will stand steadfast and hang on to his word and absolutely refuse to give up. God wants you to uh, argue your case. That's one time you need to argue your case. Use his word as a basis of your argument until you convince yourself. You're not having to convince God. God made the promise. It's ours. But we have to say it until we convince ourselves that it's true, until it becomes a conviction. And that's when we're going to start seeing things begin to manifest in our life.
Then you'll emerge out of that secret place <clears throat> saying what he's saying, and you're going to mean it. It's going to come alive on the inside of you, and that's what's going to bring the results. Now, a lot of Christians spend all of their prayer time just telling God the problem. You know, a lot of times when, uh, when you're having a prayer group, you can tell the ones that are going to just tell God their problem. Yeah. Oh, God, you know, and, and, and they're just bearing their heart. And uh, sometimes we're guilty of just pleading, and we're, we're not exercising any faith. We're just telling God the problem. And that's not going to work. We, we have to realize when we're doing that, when we're just voicing the problem, we're going to have to put our foot down and say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. Lord, I'm going to say what your word says until it becomes a conviction. Now, we've all been given the measure of faith. And so sometimes we're just saying, oh, God, just give me more faith. I just need more faith so I can believe it. No, we don't need more faith. God uh, has already given us as much faith as we need. We just need now to start putting that faith to work. So it's not lack of faith. You know, uh, the faith will grow as we as we come to a conviction that the word is true. Lack of conviction to, to believe the word simply because we're looking at everything around us and we're looking at all the doubts and all the fears and we have to stop that and quit saying, oh God, give me more faith. Oh God, take care of this problem. That needs to be prayers that we never pray. We need to say, God, this is a, a promise in your word I choose to believe it, and I'm going to keep confessing it until it becomes a conviction. Faith will come, and it'll keep coming, and it'll keep increasing when we keep choosing to believe his word. When we keep saying, God, I know it's not uh, where I'm, I'm, I have a conviction of it yet, but I'm going to get there, and I'm not going to give it up, and I'm not going to uh, confess the negative while I'm waiting. And when we choose that, Lord, I'm going to make your word my final authority. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to hang in there. So hang on to everything I'm saying today, because if you will, it takes such a little bit to move yourself from thinking you're operating in faith to coming over where it's a conviction. Okay, now, we must never lose sight of the fact that we are created in God's image. Therefore, we have the privilege and we have the responsibility to act like God acts. If we're his children. And if we're acting like God acts, then we're not telling him, oh God, this is getting worse every day. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting sicker. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not seeing uh, my bills being paid. And when we start telling God all of our problems, then we are not acting like God acts. And so we're not uh, developing a conviction on the inside of us. Romans 4.17 says, God calls into being that which does not yet exist. That's exactly what we have to be doing. God wants us to call into being, based on his word, every single thing that we're believing him for. We can call into existence the things from the word of God by absolutely speaking it forth. And sometimes we forget that and we need to be reminded. We don't create with uh, these things with our words. God's the creator. We just call his works into manifestation. Now, most Christians have never been taught <clears throat> to take their words seriously. You know, maybe they haven't read where it says that uh, all these horrible things he was saying about uh, the words of our mouth. But I'm going to tell you what, God takes our words very seriously. So seriously that he says we're going to be held accountable for every idle word that proceeds out of our mouth. How many of you have never spoken an idle word? <laughs> you know, we laugh at that because we know we have. But God says that we're going to be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. That means every non-working word. Okay, what is a non-working word? Words that are not profitable. I'm not even talking about the bad words that we send out or the uh, words where we're in depression and we're saying, God, it's just not working. I'm not even talking about getting that bad. I'm just talking about giving out words that are just not profitable, that are not speaking faith. Our words are precious in God's eyes. They're important to God. And Hebrews 3 verse 1 says that Jesus is the high priest of our confessions. And a high priest is one who takes the offerings up to God. And we've got to realize that Jesus is offering our words up to God. What do we want him to be offering up to God? You know, are we wanting to, him to be trying to offer up our, our doubt and our unbelief and our, oh, poor me? You know, uh, 
you would think it would say that Jesus is the high priest of our tithe. You know, that would make sense to us, you know. Um, but he's the high priest of the words that come out of our mouth. He offers up to the Father every confession that comes out of our mouth that lines up with the Word of God. Now, we're going to be held accountable for all those non-working, idle words, you know. And, uh, you know, I had to really stop and think, whoa, I have a lot of idle, non-working words. But it really convicted my heart, and I thought, God, I want to change. I want to do this right. And uh, so... We're going to find out that we have a lot of non-working words that are producing death every single day. Now, Charles Capps <clears throat> made a very phenomenal statement years and years ago. He said, those who say they can and those who say they can't are both right. Now, I had to think about that for a minute. The people who say they can, with God's help, they're right. The people who say they can't, they're right too. They're not going to be able to. But... Our words are such, they're so powerful that whatever comes out of our mouth, that's what, that's what we're going to have. Uh, it's like we have a stick of, you know, lighted dynamite. You know, dynamite can blast this huge rock up that's hindering and holding back the progress, or it can blow us up. And sometimes we use our words and we're changing things in the spiritual realm, and sometimes we're blowing ourselves up. We're, we're blowing up the, the victory that God could be giving us. Our words are exactly the same as dynamite. Now, many, many times, even Christians are speaking forth words that bring death. I hear that all the time, and you have too. You'll hear Christians, and, and their words are bringing death, and they're calling into existence things that are totally outside of God's will. Your words are going to work for you, or they're going to work against you. Now, you're familiar with Mark eleven twenty three, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted. But there again, it's we have to believe that what we're saying is because it's the truth from God, we have to believe that it's going to happen. It, it can't be, oh, I hope it happens. <laughs> you know, God, it's your word. It should happen. That We can't do that. Everything that we say that God says, we have to believe that it will eventually come to pass and unless we quit believing. Now, Jesus gave us the authority over our words, but what do we end up saying many times? Instead of speaking forth that this mountain has to move, I'm using the word against it, we say, oh, Lord, this mountain's getting bigger every day. You know, nothing, <coughs> nothing's getting better. Everything's getting worse. My situation is just falling apart right in front of me. And that's the way we pray a lot of times, you know. And we have what we say because we believe that mountain is getting bigger. So the mountain gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it gets bigger. And uh, uh, so watch what, it, watch what you're saying in your prayer time. Too often at the first sign of sickness, we say, oh, God, I'm sick, you know. Or sometimes we forget to even say it to God. Oh, my goodness, I'm sick. I better, I better get to a doctor fast, you know. At the first sign of lack, so many people say, oh, I'm broke. You know, it, it really looks bad. I don't see I'm ever going to pull out of this one. We hear over and over how important it is to make God's word our final authority. And we've heard it so much that sometimes it just becomes trite. It's just a, a trite saying. We're not really realizing this word is true and, and, and it means exactly what it says. But we need to say it until it becomes so embedded now in our subconscious thinking that there's not even a question. That word has to become our final authority where we never speak forth a negative thought. And when you go back and <clears throat> see the harsh things that James said about the words of our mouth, you know, that kind of gets our attention and it lets us know how wrong it is. The word must be our final authority no matter what the issue is no matter who or what might be contesting it. And I promise you, when you start making confessions based on the word and mean it, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to come against you. And sometimes it's going to be Christians. They're going to say, you know, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, and, and they'll try to talk you down. And you've got to come to a place where you know that you know that you know that you know. Now, if the word is not the final authority, you're going to have all kinds of wrong things uh, bedded down there in your heart. God's way is contrary to the world, and we're, 
and we're not going to change God's way. If we want to win, we're going to have to conform to his way of doing it. And that means we're going to have to quit confessing what we're seeing. Even in our prayer time, we can't just start telling God how bad it is, what all is going wrong. We're going to have to quit confessing what we feel and what we fear. Uh, and we're going to have to begin to confess that what that God says every single time. You believe me and release your faith and you're going to see the victory. Now, there are non-Christians who have this faith principle working for them better than we do, you know, and they're not even saved. And I thought about that, and I thought so many non-Christians are saying how prosperous they are. You know, they're saying how successful they are. They're saying how much they're enjoying life. And they're pre they pretty well are, according to what they think of a successful life. And Jesus made reference to that. He said the children of the world are wiser than the children of light. And many times when you look around, the children of the world are wiser in their confessions. They are wiser in, in their beliefs. Okay, now let me give you an example. An article was written about the co-host on the Johnny Carson show. It's been a few years back. <clears throat> but he said ahead of time that he was going to work up into becoming a co-host for the Johnny Carson show. And everybody laughed at him. They thought that was ridiculous. Well, finally, he had confessed it and believed it, and he was asked uh, to uh, do one of Johnny Carson's shows. But after only one time, uh, his show was canceled. Well, he thought, I thought I did a pretty good job. So he went to Johnny Carson, and he said, what did I do wrong? And Johnny Carson said, <clears throat> well, you do three to five jokes in X number of, of minutes, where I do 30 to 35 jokes in that length of time. But instead of giving up, that would have made post, most people just throw in the towel, but instead of giving up, this man believed he could do it, and he started confessing with his mouth, and he started really believing, I can do this. I can, I can get to the place where I can do as good a job as Johnny Carson does. And it wasn't an instant thing. It took a good while. But he believed it, he confessed it, and he told everybody about it until it happened. In fact, he had a friend that uh, actually helped get him back on the program. And this time he succeeded because he, he believed it and he confessed it. So it works even in the natural, you know. See, the world is often operating in principles that God designed for his children. But these principles will work for anybody, and it's principles that sometimes we just flat ignore, you know. Now, the Word is packed full of good promises from God, but they're not automatic. Nothing in God's Word is automatic. Even after we have fulfilled the conditions of those good promises, they're still not automatically ours. And, uh, for example, I know a lot of tithers, and they're still, uh, their finances are being devoured. And you think, well, how can that be? because they're believing the promise, uh, they're meeting the conditions, they're tithing. Uh, but we've got to realize sometimes we're doing what we're supposed to do, but we're not really believing that God's promise is that when we tithe, we're going to be blessed. So not only do we believe the word and obey, but we have to plant it to get the crop because it's a seed. Okay, how can that be? Because we've forgotten that we're operating in a law of sowing and reaping. And we have to not only be, in this particular case, we're talking about tithing. Not only do we have to be obedient to tithe, but we also have to birth in the conviction that because I tithe, this promise is true, and God will do what he says he'll do. He'll rebuke the devourer. But we have to plant that seed uh, in, in whatever a promise that we're looking at. We have to plant the seed and then we have to come to a place where we have a conviction where we believe it. In Matthew 12, 34, 35, <clears throat> the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man out of the good treasure brings forth what is good. The evil man out of his evil treasure will bring forth what is evil. Okay, good things don't come from working our fingers to the bone, rising early and retiring late. They don't come, it doesn't come that way. Good things come from God, and we receive those good things, number one, by storing those good promises down in our heart. We have to work and, and see what the Word says and say it until it becomes a conviction. Because God says in the Word, I will hide your Word in my heart. I will meditate on your Word. When? When does it tell us we'll meditate on the Word? Day and night. 
So that means you're thinking about it on a constant basis. We, re, we are responsible for storing this information from the Word down in our hearts. We have to put it in the treasury, and it's not automatic there. You know, money doesn't just show up automatically in your bank account. You have to make a deposit. Well, it's the same way we have to make deposits into the treasury of our heart. Then whatever it is that you happen to need, whether it be favor or wisdom or provision or whatever, it's stored down in your heart's treasure. If it's there, then you can bring it forth when it's needed by just believing it and confessing it because it has become a conviction. Did you know that there's a promise in the Word for every legitimate need that you'll ever have? It doesn't matter what that need might be. God's already made provision for it. God knew <clears throat> what we were going to need. He gave us a promise to cover it because He loves us. He's our Jehovah Jireh. And then He expects us to take it then and believe it, have a conviction, and, and call it into being. You know, when Jack was working in a large plant here, they were cleaning their machinery with MEK. And they would get in there and they maybe would spend two or three hours with that MEK, you know, clear up to their armpits, scrubbing down their machinery. Well, pretty soon, a number of the men in the plant came down with cancer. And uh, uh, some of them came down with leukemia. And uh, there were several of them that ended up in wheelchairs. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, fear just came all over me because I knew Jack was in that MEK every day for three years. And so uh, I said, Jack, uh, you know, I was panicked. And Jack said, hey, I am believing Mark 16, 17, that if I drink any deadly poison, it's not going to hurt me. Well, I was saying that with him, but I had to work until it became a conviction in my heart. It wasn't a conviction in my heart. I was saying it, you know, out of desperation. Oh, God, please take care of him, you know. But he was saying, no, you know, if I drink any deadly poison, it's not going to hurt me. And, uh, but we have to believe the promises and we have to confess them. Those promises are there, but they're not automatic. We've got to believe it and we've got to confess it into being. And Jack was one of the very few who didn't have anything happen to him. It's the good man that brings it forth. God doesn't bring it forth. So many times we're thinking, oh, John, God just didn't answer my prayer. No, he's given us the promise, but we're the one that brings it to pass. And we do it by saying it, believing in our heart and saying it. That's what brings it into being. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, you have what you say with your mouth without doubting. It's not saying that God will bring it to pass for you. It's God's word. It's already true. It's just waiting for us to take it and bring it to being. And <clears throat> your mouth will say whatever's down there. You know, it, whatever's down there is what's going to finally come out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth's going to speak. Now, the first thing out of our mouth in the face of a crisis now is going to be whatever it is that we've stored down there. If we haven't stored it down there, I promise you when the crisis comes, the wrong thing's going to come out. We know girls who have been assaulted. Uh, we've given these testimonies several times. And uh, many of them will, will tell you, I was assaulted and I panicked, you know. And, uh, but we know a lot of them, several girls from our cross lines through the years, uh, there was an attempted assault and they began to declare it what they had in Jesus. And they had a blood covering and they they were protected. Joanne was one of them. Uh, a guy pulled her over and it was a, a dark road. There weren't any cars. And he had her out of the car and already had her down on the ground. And she said she was screaming and fighting and kicking. And, and all of a sudden she said, I know what I'm supposed to do. And she started calling out to the Lord and saying, Lord, I thank you. Your word's true. And she started confessing the protection she had. And he finally just got up and went to his car, and on the way, she, he, uh, she heard him say, I would get a hold of a Jesus freak. <laughs> but that's what, the world may think that we're a Jesus freak, but it's worth it when you believe it and you say it. You know, uh, a tornado, it's, it's not wrong to go to a, a storm cellar. I'm not saying that it's wrong. But what needs to be coming out of us is Psalm 91. That needs to be the conviction of our heart. Lord, you're, Lord, you're protecting me, not because I'm in a storm cellar, not because I've pulled my mattress up over the top of me, because your word in Psalm 91 gives me a promise. And it works in the face of any crisis. Okay, now I've said this example before. 
But my little niece, Julie, she was thrown from a horse, and actually she slipped under the belly of the horse, and the horse drug her along, and her head was just drug on the ground. And uh, they got her to Abilene, and uh, uh, I came on over there. I got there by the time the doctor came out into the hall to talk with them. In fact, they pulled Julie in front of me, and I didn't recognize her because her face was so uh, messed up. And uh, that doctor confessed every negative thing that could possibly happen, from the loss of eyesight to the loss of hearing, the loss of life. And <clears throat> my brother turned to me. The doctor was still talking to me, and he turned around, and he said to me what God was going to do. The doctor was standing there. I, I, I'm ashamed to say that it embarrassed me that he quit listening to the, to the doctor and, and started talking to me. And she walked out of the hospital uh, just a few days later, whole and healed in every way. We cannot afford to allow anything to take precedence over what the Word of God says, no matter how convincing the so-called facts may sound. Now, I'm going to tell you what. The facts can sound pretty convincing. But every doubt thought, every fear thought, it has to be taken totally captive immediately or we'll become double-minded. And one of the best ways to take it is to realize that God has said we're going to have what we say with our mouth without doubting. But it has to be a conviction. It can't just be sane words. And then the second half of Matthew 12, 35 will come into being because it says then the evil man out of the evil treasures will bring forth that which is evil. So we store fear down in our hearts so often. And you, do you know what fear <clears throat> where it actually comes from? Fear comes from believing something other than the Word of God. That's all it is. Fear is just believing something other than the Word of God. Now, the devil doesn't play fair. You don't have to consciously store fear in your heart for it to be there. A lot of times they'll say, well, I, I haven't been thinking on fear. I haven't stored it down there. But you're going to find out if we fail to store the Word in the treasury of our heart, that fear, uh, then the fear goes in automatically by default. And the treasure is a vacuum, and it'll fill up with something. And if we're not putting that Word in there, then we're going to find out that it'll fill up with fear and, and doubt. And then when a need arises, uh, <clears throat> we're going to pull up with our mouth whatever's been stored down there in the heart. Now, we need, to, we need to remind ourselves constantly that the devil has no power over the believer. You know, some people are so afraid of the devil, what the devil's going to do. And <clears throat> Satan's only hope is to deceive the believer into believing and saying what he says. That's all he has to do is make us quit believing and saying what God says and simply believe and say what he's saying. And then it's not Satan's power that overcomes us. It's the power of our words. Our words are so powerful. When God promised Abram a son, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, which meant father of a multitude. Now, I'm sure people laughed and they probably ridiculed every time this old man who was childless would say, well, my name is father of a multitude. And that's typical of human nature to laugh, you know, at what they can't see. Now, if I didn't have a house and I lived under a mesquite tree, my name, and I, my name meant I live in a mansion, you know, you'd laugh. But that's exactly what Abraham was having to do, you know. But God's way worked, and Abraham believed God. He confessed God's word, I am Abraham. I'm the father of a multitude. And God counted it, the Bible says, as righteousness. When Gideon was hiding in the wine press because he was afraid of the Midianites, the angel came in and called him a valiant warrior. Well, he went out of that wine press to become one of the Old Testament's greatest military leaders. When the Shunammite woman, when her son died, nothing came out of her mouth except, all is well, all is well. She was not about to turn loose her mouth after God had given her uh, this promise. She was going to hang on to those promises. When Jesus was going to Jairus' house to pray for his daughter, the servants came out and said, don't trouble the master any longer because your daughter's already died. Well, Jesus immediately said, don't quit believing. Well, she's dead. And yet he's saying, don't quit believing. If Jairus had started speaking death and saying, well, it's a little late, she's already dead, it would have been too late. Don't ever confess death over anything that you plan to see resurrected. If you're believing God for something, don't come to a place where you 
confess death over it, or you'll end up burying it. You know, and it might be your health, it might be a marriage, it might be some other relationship, finances, whatever. Birth in your decision to believe the word in every area, and you'll find that the overflow of that steadfast faith will be words of power that literally can call things into being and pull down strongholds of the enemy. Because that's, that's what's been made available to us. And I, I, I felt when I was praying, I said, God, this is so simple, but how come we miss it? And he said, because you haven't developed a conviction of it, that you're going to believe it and you're going to say it no matter what it looks like, no matter what everybody else is saying, that you're going to stay true to me just like Abraham did when he stayed true to the promise I gave him. Just like Gideon did, just exactly like the Shunammite woman did. He said, all these examples are there, but you're going to have to believe it and you're going to have to get a conviction of it in your heart. And when you do, the Lord said, you'll start seeing miracles happen. If God has put so much um, emphasis on the words of our mouth, then we need to take the time to say, okay, Lord, how do I make those words come alive? And the way we make it come alive is when we say, Lord, I'm going to develop a conviction. I may not believe it as much as I need to believe it right now, but Lord, I'm going to say it and I'm going to pray it in my prayer closet until it becomes that conviction. And when it does, you're going to start seeing miracles.